Yes, bro. Everyone else. Good evening, Hot Wars. How are we doing? Yeah. Brilliant. It's great to be back in the club, isn't it? It's fantastic. I've come down from Prescott this evening, just uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the uh, geography of the area. Prescott sits between Liverpool and St. Helens. And uh, it's got a bit of an identity crisis. Can't make its mind up whether it's in Liverpool or St. Helens. And, uh, and quite frankly, the, the, the people can't either. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's important. You know, when you're a kid growing up, you've got to have some identity, haven't you? And so um, well, there's a little rule of thumb that you can apply, which is that if your dad's sleeping with you or your sister, you're from St. Helens. <laughs> sleeping with your mum's sister or a best matey from Liverpool. So. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's okay, I'm from the Liverpool side, so I'm, I'm, I'm safe with kids. <laughs> I've got kids of my own, I've got kids of my own. I love my kids, they're great kids. They're, obviously, they're, they're fantastic. I've got three daughters, but you know, sometimes, geez, it's hard work being the only bloke in the house. Because um, I'm outnumbered five to one. I'm a sexual minority in my own home. Because <laughs> there's the three girls. And then there's my wife, and God love him, even my dog now identifies as female. Because <laughs> it's just easy, you know. And I don't know if you know this, but, but when women live together, there's some strange biochemical self-defense mechanism that kicks in <laughs> and makes them form a coalition. <laughs> You're like Charlie's Angels, or in my case, the Witches of Eastwick. <laughs> And you can't say anything, you know, I, I've not been right since 1998. <laughs> and they can, you know, you argue with one of them, you argue with the ball, and, and they can scent the blood in the water. You don't like sharks, <laughs> only more efficient. <laughs> and the slightest thing will kick them off. You know? Oh, that's a nice top. What do you mean, that's a nice top? <laughs> I'm just saying that's a nice top, so why are you having a go at my top? I'm not having a go at your top, I just said it was a nice top. Yeah, why are you having a go at her top? I wasn't having a go at her top. I wish you were, I heard you having a go at her top. And then the third one kicked in. Is he having a go at her top? I'm not having a go at her top. Yes, you are, and now you're shouting. I'm not shouting. You are shouting. Look, you made a cry. And then the wife comes in. Who's made you cry? He has. Shout that about a top. I'm not shouting! It's a nice fucking top! <laughs> so why couldn't you just say it was a nice top? <laughs> and it was worse a few years ago because they were all teenagers at the same time, you know. I mean, not the wife, obviously. <laughs> Because I'm not from St. Helens. <laughs> oh, jeez. But it's, no, I'm, I'm very proud of my girls. I'm really proud of them because uh, they've all grown up now. They're all grown up into what I'd call strong, independent women. Feminists with a small F. <laughs> Unlike a friend of mine who's a feminist with a whopping big F. And she's always banging on about it, you know, diversity, inclusion, all this sort of stuff. And she's a lawyer in the construction industry. Always going on about it, never should. And I get it, you know, I'm a new man. It's the 21st century. I've got a sourdough starter. Yeah. <laughs> but she never shuts up about it. And she showed me this picture on her phone the other day. She said, look at that. That's what's wrong with the construction industry. I said, well, what's the problem? And it's a picture of, it, of an industry dinner. It's mainly blokes. It's mainly white blokes aged about 25 to 50. I said, well, what's the problem? She says, where's the diversity and inclusion there? I said, well, you can't say that. Some of those blokes might be gay. Some of them might be bi. Some of them may be in transition. Some of them may be dual heritage, just light skin. She said, no, where are the women? Well, they might have gone for a wee. <laughs> they usually do. <laughs> no, she says, the women aren't included. Nobody ever includes the women. Name me one man who's ever properly included women in construction. And apparently Fred West wasn't the answer she was looking for. <laughs> but the good news is, the good news is that um, 
So the gender imbalance in my family has, has been redressed because I'm a granddad now. I know I don't look old enough, but I'm a granddad now. I've got two grandsons, two and five, and, and the eldest started school last year. And he went in a couple of weeks ago for that, uh, that World Book Day thing. Have you heard of World Book Day? Yeah, yeah. You know the kids going to school dressed in character? But I'm not sure that my daughter's quite got it right, you know, because uh, she got this note back from school and, and it read, it read, Dear Ms. Edge, Ms. Very politically correct. Dear Ms. Edge, thank you so much for the obvious time and effort you took with Elliot's costume as we prepared to celebrate World Book Day. The false tan and dreadlocks must have taken you hours. <laughs> However, I feel duty bound to point out that this term, we've been reading Charles Dickens with the children, and we're rather hoping that Elliot's costume would represent the character of Jacob Marley. <laughs> Not, as your son so eloquently argued, his older brother Bob. <laughs> And while we encourage the use of props to bring the children's chosen characters to life, we felt that a six inch spliff <laughs> <coughs> perhaps overstepped the mark for year four. Thank you for your continued support, Mrs. Davis. Yeah, so we've got all that to contend with. But uh, the, the good news is, the good news is that the youngest girl's getting married. She's told us she's getting married and we couldn't be happier for her. Well, I say we couldn't be happier. We couldn't be happier until she told us how much it was going to cost. <laughs> so what's the first thing you do as a dad? You go on Google, you know, average cost of a UK wedding 2022. 30,000 pounds. 30,000 pounds. Have you any idea how many lights I'd have to turn off? <laughs> so we've been looking at ways that we might be able to save a bit of money on the wedding. Wedding photographers. Grand and a half for a wedding photographer. When me and my missus got married, my mate did it for a couple of pints and a curry. I was a proper photographer. He was qualified and everything, but he was a scenes of crime photographer. <laughs> Wasn't used to working with the living. Which came in quite handy with my wife found. <laughs> Came in quite handy in general, because uh, most scouse weddings end up being a crime scene, one way or another. <laughs> but it was okay, you know, because once you got over the initial shock, you know, with him turning up with plastic bags on his feet and a shower cap, it was okay. But it got a bit weird, because we got to the cutting of the cake, and he insisted on photographing the knife separately. <laughs> Put a little label on it, stuck in a plastic bag, we never saw it again. <laughs> But the good thing, he wasn't phased. He wasn't phased, because a couple of weeks before the wedding, my Auntie Peggy died. Aww. No, it was much sadder than that. My Auntie Peggy died. <laughs> but he didn't make a big fuss, just, you know, on, on, on the family photograph. He just put a little white outline of where she should have been. <laughs> <laughs> With my Uncle Matt looking into the space, <laughs> sobbing, <laughs> holding a ruler. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's all going ahead, it's all going ahead. And, uh, but it's not been easy getting to this stage because, you know, up my girls, they're all good looking girls, they're all stunners, you know. And over the years, that attracts a bit of male attention and it's not always welcome. And these lads just won't take the hint. And there was this one lad a couple of years ago, Jesus, he was on the phone, he was at the front door, he just wouldn't take the hint. And I, I was at my wit's end, because you feel a bit protective as a dad. And then my savior arrived in the form of Liam Neeson. <laughs> now this might be a bit of a spoiler alert, but if, if you've never seen the film Taken, Liam Neeson plays an ex-CIA operative who doesn't mind getting his hands dirty. And his only darling daughter goes on a holiday to Paris, a holiday that he doesn't approve of. And on her very first day there, she's kidnapped by Albanian people traffickers. And she's screaming down the phone when she rings her dad, she, but she gets snatched and she drops the phone. And the phone's still live. And the kidnapper picks it up. And Liam Neeson can hear him breathing. And he says to him, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If it's money you're after, I don't have any. But what I do have is a particular set of skills. Skills acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. Give me my daughter back and that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you. 
I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. Now, in fairness, the lad took it quite well. You know. <laughs> for an eight-year-old. You know. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, you've been a lovely audience. I've been Peter Edgeman. Yay! Peter Edgeman, everybody! Yay!